Um, it's really great to be here. What a great start with all those ideas bubbling away from the beginning. And uh, yes, as you introduced Marina, I'm here in the kind of role of the uh, slightly aging character, looking back, back to the old days uh, over the grand period of 15 years that uh, Steps has been beavering away in all the networks that are fantastically represented here in this meeting. Um, and I'm going to talk about how this so-called steps pathways approach has conditioned our approach to methods, what we've learned and what the things we've done and the things that remain rather embarrassingly undone uh, or only realized at the last minute. So that's the kind of thing I'm gonna kick us off with. And um, really, I guess the, the starting point is to just uh, re recap what the pathways approach is uh, is all about. It's about trying to shift not only academic and policy discourse, but politics more widely around sustainability from a kind of one track way forward approach to the recognition and appreciation for multiplicities of pathways. There is no area of life relevant to sustainability where there are not multiplicities of paths going forward from that point which change could follow. And of course, what tends to happen is the kinds of change that get talked about and therefore more likely the kinds of change that actually occur are those that are favored by the most powerful interests, the loudest voices. So for methods then, the challenge that we began with, uh, which we picked up from many colleagues around the world at the beginning, was the question of how work in academia, which of course is our main location, or indeed other privileged settings that produce or which critique knowledge can be more deliberately intentionally oriented towards concrete actions to support emancipatory struggles. Uh, and by that, I mean struggles for greater pluralities of alternative pathways for change, just to get a better chance for these marginalized pathways because they are normally ignored, sidelined, suppressed, and quite often actively oppressed in the world in which we live, whether it's in the energy sector, housing, the way cities develop, the way communications take place, the way food is produced, etc. And doing those things without inadvertently reinforcing the privilege that we undoubtedly have begun with, for the best of intentions, simply giving uh, volume to our own voice, or even worse, appropriating, again inadvertently, the voices of others. So it's a pretty tough challenge. And as a means to that end then, we, we kind of dimly grasped right from the beginning, but we learned more about that as we went through. There, there wasn't like a defined set of methods for doing that. Maybe it's better viewed as a challenge of hacking methods, because there's so many diverse methods can in particular conditions be useful to that kind of agenda. So it's about hacking methods in order not to sort of in a linear deterministic way do the job, but to help reshape wider practices and institutions. The challenge is that methods are like little seeds. They can go into a given context and with a fair wind and a bit of luck, they might actually help to be generative of the kinds of things we want to see. So we then, and here working uh, especially with our partners around the world in this present steps consortium and with the summer school uh, practic uh, practitioners who came in over a number of years and engaged with us there, we developed a framework for thinking about methods based on two basic parameters. What goes in, what comes out. And in order to hack these power ridden environments that methods have to subsist in, whether in academia or in wider policy debates, these two qualities mean the following. What goes in, the inputs, can be relatively narrow or relatively broad. And they can be so in a number of dimensions, the kinds of challenge they address, the kinds of options for action that are illuminated, the kinds of harms or benefits that are taken into account, the degree to which fairness and distributional issues are central to what's being attended to, the, the, the question of whether uncertainties are addressed at all, and if so, it, to what depth and what degree, and crucially, the kinds of perspectives that are involved. All these you could see as inputs to the method of various kinds. How do methods engage with all these different dimensions as things they attend to? 
But there's another dimension to this role of methods, which is not what goes in, but what comes out. How the method engages with wider processes of knowledge production and of policymaking and wider politics as a whole in order to help inform, shape, catalyze change. And here you've got uh, uh, the challenge of opening up, not broadening out the inputs, but opening up the outputs. And what that means in effect is, do methods simply crank out a particular answer? Or do they actually inform those who uh, they're speaking to about how the answer depends on how you frame the question? So they don't say, here's our conclusion. They say, if you assume X, then the conclusion would be A. If you assume Y, then the conclusion would be B. And that's entirely independent of how broad the inputs are. You can have a very broad base method with lots of inputs, like a big global assessment, which cranks out one de de deterministic answer. For instance, the IPCC is an example of that. And likewise, you can, from a rather narrow base, actually open up all kinds of uh, very salient questions. So that was our basic framework for thinking about methods. And in doing that, what we've tried to strive to, to, to do is is to show how that is in principle applicable right across all the various dividing lines between methods. There's lots of jealously guarded boundaries, actively policed borderlines, occasional raids across borders uh, from one group to another between expert and participatory, quantitative, qualitative, analytic, deliberative, interpretive methods. Um, and in principle, we believe that this framework applies to all of them. So one can think about all kinds of methods in this ways. So for instance, a conventional quantitative analysis might be very precise in what it says to policymaking, ordering the different pathways that might be pursued very um, uh, sort of definitively, or it can acknowledge uncertainties, or it can actually deliberately unpick how different perspectives, different values, different assumptions in appraisal lead to different answers. But likewise, that's true of qualitative or interpretive or participatory work which can focus on consensus, common ground, verdicts in citizens' juries, or can instead, in a similar way, try and illuminate how different ways of being, ways of thinking, ways of knowing lead to very contrasting conclusions without having to force an engineer consensus or a conclusion. So that was our framework for thinking about the broadening out and the opening up of methods. Of course, methods are never precisely located. The devils are in details, but a crucial, uh, uh, thing to bear in mind in this in relation to the kinds of issues that Rose and Marina raised at the beginning and put it out very nicely in the blog that kicked off our work on Methods Year on the STEBS website, is that power tends to concentrate attention in the top left corner of this field. So the usual suspects of methods used in global assessments and sustainability science around the world, cost benefit analysis, risk assessment, ecosystem services, various kinds of stakeholder collaborative techniques are in that top left box. We don't intend to denigrate them. That's a very honorable uh, set of practices, but they tend to be overemphasized because they tend to generate justification, help those in power to justify their authority, to foster trust, to secure acceptance, to manage blame. So that's why they tend to be emphasized. So without denigrating them, the, the challenge is how to restore some balance, to move a little bit more equitably to more caring rather than controlling analysis, to caring attention and recognition for different ways of being in what is a very pluralistic world. And we recognize in that, and we learned more and more as time went on, that yes, methods can help prefigure and catalyze and reinforce the emergence of more emancipatory spaces for thinking about alternative pathways to sustainability. But the circumstances in which that really works are circumstances in which collective action, political mobilization opens up the institutional space. That institutions, that political agendas are disrupted, uh, destabilized for a period that allow these kinds of methods to come in, to allow this more kind of murmurating dynamic. So we, we kind of, we always thought this was the case, but we've really learned much more deeply over time how important that institutional structural challenge is to making methods work. You can't just engineer a situation with methods like the one that appear in the lower right of this diagram. And so of course then what's really going on here is a dance. It's a dance between the wider encompassing political circumstances and the kinds of approaches that's taken shaping policy imaginations and, uh, and 
shaping or challenging those imaginations. So it's a dialectic and uh, the methods can help shape the environment, but the environment is crucial to uh, the conditions in which methods can work or not. So it's about transforming underlying imaginations in and moving from this categorical, hierarchical, individualistic, controlling imagination that pervades so much sustainability science, not without denigrating it, has that the planetary dashboard kind of, kind of mentality to more relational, mutualistic, uh, collective understandings of the challenges of change. And in doing that, their methods can have all kinds of different kinds of registers. So it's again, it's not, not, not thinking about one method. It's also not thinking about one way of using methods. In fact, quite often the body language around the method is as important as the actual procedural details of the methods in helping to prefigure or to catalyze or to pivot changes. So, I mean, just to give examples of that, you know, the medium can be the message. So by opening up, even in a micro fashion in a method, we can help prefigure the kinds of changes that we're talking about, illustrate them. Um, legitimate them. Trojan horses, where a method that appears maybe quantitative can get under the radar of a policy process. And once it gets inside, it opens up and you realize, oh, oh my goodness, it was quantitative, but look what it's doing. It's, it's actually uh, exploring all these various sensitivities, all these various different kinds of answers. Or it can help pivot change in ways that perpetrate a kind of political judo where the precisely the power of the structures that are being challenged can be uh, an asset to those doing the challenging. Their depth and their extent can magnify and amplify in certain settings in ways that can be very useful if you're successful in getting a particular approach picked up. So I'm not claiming we've had huge success in any of those areas. We have moments of, uh, moments of uh, think feeling a little bit good about it and it's always an ongoing struggle. It's about then caring about methodologies, not just individual methods, but ways of thinking about methods for opening up, it's not just about informing the cockpit, uh, providing a message for a planetary dashboard. That's part of the mix, crucial at times, but it tends to get overemphasized. Um, and instead, it's a, instead of that kind of controlling idea about planning as if the planet is being controlled, we should control our way away from the sustainability challenges. It's, it's about a more mutualistic relation. So you can relate even to those institutions in horizontal ways with these kinds of methods. It's not about plug and play. There's no method that just plugs in without being influenced by its environment. Um, and as Rose said at the beginning, then it's about repertoires, repertoires of genres, but playing, playing music in certain ways. And in the end, it's all about this, this kind of murmurating dynamic. It's a remarkable thing that at least in the uh, rather inadequate English language, the word murmurations, which is used of these wonderful flocking behaviors you see in birds and fish, is at the same time means this exquisitely choreographed dancing dynamic of moving around where very abrupt radical change can occur very quickly if the conditions are right. But it also means descent, suppressed descent. And it's quite interesting that those two meanings come together in what we're trying to talk about with methods, that methods can have these effects of diversity, moving together, of adapting horizontally to others, of, of creating uh, new kinds of change rather than just keeping them and, and of, of, of failing. There are all kinds, when you watch these flocking behaviors, all kinds of things move off and then come back again in failures, which actually inform the movement of the whole. Of course, there's a lot that we thought we knew that actually we found out we still had to learn. Um, it's a bit embarrassing, but you know, that yes, methods, all this grandiose uh, uh, claims I've been, for instance, rehearsing here, methods can hack cultures, but cultures sure, sure shape methods as well. So you can put your methods out there, but then when you see them go out there, you very often find them reverting to type and being used in ways that uh, reflect the environments they've moved into. We began with complexity. Complexity is a very powerful metaphor, but uh, there's a lot, it's a scaffolding, but there's much it can't build. And we've tended to move a bit away from complexity because it carries so much baggage on its own. Uh, whilst being valid, it's, it's not far from being enough to do this task I'm outlining. Political economy is just too heavy to leave to peripheral visions. We began by saying, yes, political economy is really important, but that's being dealt with. Uh, we didn't quite put it like that, but it was a danger of that sometimes. And you really do have to get traction with these issues. And we've realized that over time. And even more beyond that, that the structures that these methods are trying to engage with in order to challenge, to pivot, uh, to prefigure change in, are not just deep and outside. They're inside us. They're in the room with us. 
They constitute us, we're immersed in them, structures of modernity, structures of coloniality, structures of patriarchy. And, and particularly this year, what we're thinking about with methods is how we can really explore the ways methods can engage with those very deep structures of power in the world. And we also learned, um, not of our own doing so much, but that organizations are expendable. What's important are these movements, these academic, intellectual, political movements are the important thing. And um, actually sometimes there's a great strength in a sort of churn of uh, moving from organizational form to organizational form, because otherwise you generate your own inadvertent mini incumbencies and hegemonies without really realizing it. So that's it really, that's a, an attempt to uh, sum up some of the things we began with, some of the things we've uh, uh, learned along the way. Uh, we began working on methods in 2006, and I don't know if this is helpful, but one way of seeing it is it's like a, uh, I, tr I try and spend time on beaches when I can, and uh, so the step center just came in like a, just one wave of activist scholarship among so many. There were so many waves before. There were many alongside us, which we discovered, and it's been exhilarating discovering them in the course of our work. There are many more to come. And it's through wave after wave. It's not like these struggles are things you win in a definitive way. It's a continual responsibility you pass on down and you inherit from others. And it's off, wave after wave, tide after tide is how beaches are shaped and methods are part of that shaping process. So it's a real privilege to be here for this discussion today and uh, introduce some of the uh, themes which I've done rather inadequately. Um, and some of the most rewarding of these it waves emerging from the networks that we've been in are here to talk today and I'm really looking forward to hearing from them. The African Research and Impact Network, which we'll hear about later on, the Umbela organization, which we'll hear about after the break. And right now, from Annabel Marine to talk about her experiences around the development of the Bio Left Initiative. So thanks very much for your attention. I hope that made at least a little bit of sense. <laughs> 